I'm not scared of anything. That's what I yelled to my brother as I slammed the door to my car shut. But things have changed. I have changed. I remember his smirk. How he was holding out my jacket. The way he spouted off an endless list of things I should be scared of. Skinwalkers, wendigos, witches, and even other humans. He presented each one as reason after reason of why this idea was stupid, saying that I still had time to flake out and save face. I remember rolling my eyes, snatching my jacket from him, sliding into my car, and yelling that I'm not scared before speeding away into the dark outline of the mountains. They stood out stark against the setting sun, and boy, how I wish I would have listened. I was wrong. And he was right. Now, I'm scared. But let me back up a bit. It all started about two days ago. I was out of my mind depressed. I could barely get out of bed. I thought about throwing myself in front of cars, over bridges, off buildings, just dying. I thought about dying all the time. And enough was enough. One of the few friends I had brought up the idea that I should try solo camping and it might clear my mind that the wilderness, the silence, the solitude would do me good. He gave me a list of spots, some were more isolated than the others. And of course, being in the situation that I was, I decided on the most isolated one. This one was about a three hour hike from the last campsite far out in the Rocky Mountain National Forest. I remember his face, the surprise, the acceptance. Are you sure about this? His voice cracked. I nodded, saying nothing. It's a pretty secluded place, especially for a first time camper. He shrugged, but then again, it's a beautiful spot. It'll definitely give you some perspective and the night sky out there is insane. I said thanks and turned to leave, but he spoke up again. A word of advice from a veteran. Don't go out at night, no matter what you hear. You might end up getting fucked up by a bear or lion. The drive up the mountains was soothing. The gently curving roads that wove their way through the trees and up the rocks were exciting to navigate. And soon, my mind was now in a peaceful state. I decided to leave electronics this trip, even going as far as securing my phone in my glove box. I wanted to be completely free of all that shit, able to focus on the moment, then to let my mind wander into the past or fear the future. I would be gone for five days and four nights. Enough time for me to hopefully recover and reassess my life and what I was doing with it. I found the entrance to the park with ease and continued to the closest lot to my campsite. Nighttime was arriving, and I silently cursed myself for leaving so late. I sat in my vehicle for a good 30 minutes, before deciding that it would be too risky hiking three hours in near pitch black. There were four other tents set up in the lot. I found some room for one more, and soon, I had my own tent set up. The night was very comfortable. I was surrounded by people talking, Laughing people and happy children who ran round and round screaming. A few of them offered me roasted hot dogs and s'mores and even beers and I filled my belly. I was rolled up in my sleeping bag before the last dying embers faded away. The second night didn't go as smooth. I woke up late, well rested, but still groggy and took my time repacking my tent. I hesitated at first, wondering if I should just stay there. But at 3 p.m. another family showed up with proof they had reserved the site. So I gathered my things and set off, and I quickly got lost. Navigating by map and compass for the first time and alone is a lot more difficult than it sounds. And the trees. The trees can be misleading. They can turn you around, make you think you're on the right path. When ready, you're miles from where you're supposed to be. Instead of taking me three hours to get to the site, it took me almost twice that time 
and I was quickly losing what little light was left in the day. Finally, I found the site. I quickly set up my tent, building a small fire in front. It was dark now, and I was jumpy. Every sound I heard was magnified. Every shadow cast by the dim light of the fire, a menace. With fear, I crawled into the tent and crawled up in my bag, trying to will myself into sleep. After a while, I was snoozing, about to drift off, when I heard it. The sound of a foot crunching outside. My eyes shot open, and I reached for my flashlight, but didn't turn it on. I waited. I heard the sound again. Someone, or something, was definitely walking around my tent. It sounded like whoever this was, was trying to be quiet. It went on for hours in inconsistent bursts, until I finally decided it was an animal, scavenging for the scraps or inspecting my tent. By dawn I was snoozing again, and the noise had finally stopped. I told myself I would sleep for an hour or two, giving myself time to rest up. I woke up confused, exhausted, and groggy and started to panic before remembering I was out camping and that I needed to start hiking back now. But when I came out the tent, I saw that the sun was already setting. To say I was upset would be an understatement. I hesitated for a moment, trying to decide what to do. I wanted to go home. I wanted to leave, see how far I could get out there. But deep down I knew I would get lost and most likely end up in a worse situation. So I began collecting as much wood as I could to build a big ass fire and get ready to hunker down for the night. The light from the sun seemed to disappear fast. The third night was pretty problematic. I sat awake in my tent for hours after the sun went down, waiting. The darkness around me seemed to crush the light from the fire making it seem like a small tiny candle in a sea of shadows. For hours I sat there, listening, afraid. Finally, I realized I was just being ridiculous, that what I heard the night before was actually nothing to fear, that my monkey mind was just playing tricks on me, keeping me alert for no reason. So I bundled myself up and lay down, and that's when I heard it, softly at first. A footstep, then two, three, growing louder. I sat up and felt my eyes increase to the size of saucers, and my breath quickened. What was that? I had to know. I was operating purely off of fear. I heard the noise. It sounded like something running and running around and around my tent. Suddenly, the side of my tent pushed in as if someone was slapping it from the outside. Hey, I'm awake. I'm in here. I tried to stand, tripping myself up in my sleeping bag in the process, and slammed into the front of my tent. Scrambling up, I quickly unzipped the flap and ran outside with a red tinted flashlight. That's when I saw a shape scurry away, and I quickly followed. And there, standing at the edge of the firelight, Barely visible was the silhouette of a person. They were standing with their back towards me. Their arms were hanging in strange positions by their sides. Their head pointed straight away from me. I took a step towards them and a branch cracked underneath me. The sound seemed to startle the person and they turned their head so slightly. Hey, I said again, what, what the, the fuck, fuck man? man? A sound that crescended into a scream. It was a laughing sound, and it echoed around me, rattling around in my head. I ran, leaping into my tent, sipping it up behind me, crawling into my sleeping bag, crying. And that's when the world around me exploded, or rather, imploded. The walls of the tent shook, like hundreds of hands were slapping it, poking it, punching it. Outside, what sounded like dozens of people running around shattered the silence. I don't know how or when I fell asleep. I actually think I fainted. Either way, I woke up the next day to a reddish glow surrounding me. I sat up and ran outside, 
looking around for proof of what I heard. But there was nothing. No footprints, handprints, or any disturbance at all. Man, fuck all this, I said to myself, throwing my things chaotically into my bag. I'm gonna leave today, in the dark. I couldn't stay another night here. I was just starting to unpull the tent when I heard it. A sound in the distance, perhaps carried to me by the wind, which was picking up around me. Help me. Help me. Please. Oh God. Oh God. Help me. I reacted more out of instinct than logic and began running towards the sound before realizing that I, in no way, was in a place to help whoever was screaming. Still, I tried to locate the source of the sound, following the voice for about 30 minutes. Where are you? I yelled looking around me through the maze of trees. I'm here. I'm over here. Where are you? I'm over here. Where are you? Where are you? Cleta screams descended into a deep unsettling laughter. Scared out of my mind, I turned and ran back the way I came. By some miracle, I made it back to my site, grabbed my pack, and uprooted the post of the tent, thinking that I would just roll it up and carry it back, instead of taking the time to fold it neatly and shove it into its bag. As I pulled each pole, the tent was falling a little bit, but it was only on the third pole out of six that I realized it wasn't falling fully flat. Confused, I peered into the tent and reeled in horror, too afraid to even scream. There was someone sitting inside, but not just anyone. It was me sitting there, pale and bone thin, a too wide grin plaster on my face. A single droplet of blood rolled down from each eye, which instead of having green eyes were totally black. I jumped back, tripping over my own feet. Laughing rose up around me again as I scrambled up to my feet, and I saw my hand that was in my hand reach out from the tent, followed by the other, then the head. This face looked up at me, still smiling, then laughed again. I screamed and I ran, and I kept running. I don't even know if I was running the right way, but I couldn't even use the sun anymore for guidance since it had almost fully set. I ran without looking where I was going. I kept looking behind me to see if that thing was following me. I could feel the trees scratching me up, pushing against me like they were trying to hold me back, almost holding me still until that thing came for me. Suddenly, a light flashed in my face and I ran into something solid, something black, something that wrapped around me. I instantly cowered, hiding my face in my hands. Fuck. Oh please God no, I heard my own voice terrified, shaking. Hey, calm down, it's alright, you just scared me, what's wrong? I looked up into the gray eyes of a human face, the face of a middle aged man to be exact. He was holding me up, the flashlight he was using lay falling at our feet. I looked back, fearful of what I might see, but there was nothing. Only trees swinging slowly in the slight breeze. Hey, um, was that you? Screaming? I came out here to check. I couldn't speak. I was too terrified. I shook my head. Were you camping out there alone? He asked, letting me go and bending down to retrieve the flashlight. I nodded, then began crying. Hey, it's alright. It can be spooky out here. My car is right over there. He gestured with his head back behind him. I wiped my nose and blinked, finally finding my voice. Who are you? He glanced at me then away. Um, a park ranger. But he didn't look like one. He was wearing a smooth black suit, black tie, and white shirt. And his shoes were polished leather, not even hiking boots. Come on now, he said again taking my pack and swinging it into his back. As he did so, his jacket flapped slightly and I saw what looked like a handgun strapped to his belt. How did you find me? He shrugged. Good hearing, I guess. We entered a small clearing and I saw a black SUV with tinted windows. 
headlights flaring, with the engine still running. He popped the trunk and threw my bag in as I climbed into the passenger side seat. He climbed into the driver's seat and asked me where he should take me. I told him the lot number and we were on our way. He flipped the cubby between us open and pulled out a bag. Do you want cornuts? He asked holding out the bag to me. I took it gratefully and began chomping away. I licked my fingers then looked back at him. So are you really a park ranger? He looked at me, then back to the road, but still, I stared at him, transfixed. He looked exhausted, his wood-colored hair, dirty from the forest. I, um... The SUV jerked to a sudden stop and the man let out a slow, low breath. His eyes narrowed and he looked over at me, then back to the dirt trail in front of us. I followed his gaze, feeling the fear churning up inside me. And there, in the middle of the road, was me. The other me. Its limbs were hanging limply, as if they were broken. And that sickly smile was still plastered across its face. Then, it waved. The man looked back at me. Then back at this thing that wasn't me. Then back at me. And then again, I met his gaze. Alright, fuck that. I don't get paid enough for this shit. The man said before slamming his foot on the accelerator straight towards the thing. We both felt the impact. The car bounced over the body and the man kept driving. But around us, in between the trees, stirred into the darkness, the laughing sound boiled up again. We finally reached the lot, bathed in the first light of the rising sun. The man behind me seemed to be deep in thought, distracted, I was still scared but hopeful that whatever that thing was, it was now dead, crushed by the car, or at least so badly wounded that it would soon die. The SUV slowed to a stop, and the man popped the trunk and hopped out. He walked to the back and grabbed my pack as I jumped out. He handed it to me and I took it, then thanked him for everything. Not a problem, he said. All in a day's or night's work. His lips quiver as if he was about to smile. I turned to leave, but he spoke up again. Hey, I turned to face him again. If you ever want to talk about what you um saw, or, you know, just talk, call me. He held out a card. I took it and looked down at it. It was a black card, and only had a single number on it. There was no area code. So, um, I began, but I heard a door slam and looked up. The man was already back in his car. He waved at me, then sped off back the way we had come, back towards that thing. I shoved the card in my pocket, climbed into my car, and left. I still haven't told anyone about what happened, even when they ask why I refuse to go camping ever again. I just shrug and tell them that it wasn't my thing, that I prefer a warm bed and the sounds of a busy city. Ever so often though, I'll sometimes pull out this card, my fingers lingering over the phone, wondering who the man really was, and if he would really be able to explain what happened to me. I'm going to start off this story by explaining that it's not mine. I'm just the one who wrote it all down. I'm not Denier the actual name of the Navajo, and this is how I'm going to refer to them from here on out. I have never lived on a reservation, and I know very little about their folklore. I was actually in between of believing all these paranormal things for a really long time until something happened to me a few years ago that made me into a believer. Nothing to do with skinwalkers or things of that nature. But it definitely made me believe in ghosts. This story was told by my Denia friend Sam. And comes from his own experience. I met Sam on a photo gig a few years after graduating art school. And we connected through our shared interest in the paranormal. We would tell stories about our personal paranormal experiences. All names have been changed at Sam's request for privacy. And I'm using a different account. Sam also gave me permission to write this, 
and fully cooperated with me as I put this together. According to him, he's too lazy and I have too much time on my hands, so he was fine with me putting this together for him. Sam is a full-blooded Denye. His mother and father grew up in the nation near New Mexico. They had Sam at a very young age and broke up a few years after he was born. His mother moved back to Illinois with his now stepfather, who is white and Catholic. Sam grew up in Chicago suburb and lived the most of his childhood and teenage years there. He would visit his dad for a couple weeks a few times a year, but never really spent a huge amount of time out on the res. It was at 20 that Sam moved in with his dad on the reservation. He said to get a better understanding of his heritage, as he said it, and stay there till he was about 24. He was very interested in his Denia heritage, especially when he started developing his art practice as a painter and photographer. As he spent more and more time on the res, he grew a deep interest in Denia superstition, I guess as a way to connect to his culture that he felt he didn't do enough to be a part of during his childhood and teenage years. Since he was raised in Midwestern suburban white culture because of his mother and stepdad. While on the res, he made friends with and eventually dated a girl that we're going to call Jess, who had fully grown up on the res. She was a little older than Sam and got her teaching degree in another state before coming back to the res to teach high school. She was basically agnostic, but had a very superstitious family. In fact, her great uncle, who we're going to call John, was a medicine man. I'm not really familiar with the details surrounding this practice, and Sam also didn't talk too much about this, but basically, he was a very respected elder and was extremely superstitious. He often spoke of Dania folklore, creatures, magic, etc., and took it all very serious. John was pretty old and often needed help around his property, so Sam was quite often over there helping him out with odd jobs. Sam felt weird taking money from the old man, especially since Sam already had a part-time job as an art teacher and sold his paintings and photos in Santa Fe art markets. So as payment, Sam would ask John to share some of his knowledge with him. It was Sam's way of connecting to his heritage. He told me that they would talk for an hour or two every night that Sam came over to help. Sam would basically grill him on every random, denier related thing under the sun and would generally get an earful about it, except when it came to one specific topic, Ginadroshi. Sam, having spent most of his childhood with his mom and stepdad off the res, didn't have the same outlook on skinwalkers that other Denia did. The whole thing about not speaking about them wasn't something he subscribed to, mainly because A, Sam grew up in the Chicago area where no skinwalkers would be around anyways, and B, he was raised Catholic and didn't believe in Denia superstitions. He was pretty interested in this part of Dania culture because of how common skinwalkers were on the internet. So naturally, his interest in them disturbed John and he generally shut down any discussion of them. She got visibly upset and told him to never speak of them to her or her great uncle ever again. This was really weird to Sam since Jess wasn't superstitious or even religious for that matter. He thought that his agnostic girlfriend wouldn't be so weird about these things. She explained to Sam that, despite her being agnostic, that was one thing she knew was real, because she and other members of her family had experiences. She told him a very similar story to the types you'll see posted online. Late at night on the res, driving home, and seeing what you think is a coyote or a sheep following you at a great speed only upon closer inspection see what appears to be human underneath animal skin or a half man half coyote kind of creature this happened to jess when she was a little girl while being driven home by her father great uncle john came and performed some sort of protection cleansing ritual that they thought would cover them at least for a few years 
It wasn't until Jess moved back after gaining her degree that she encountered one again. This time running along the rooftops of some homes and buildings in town. She thought somehow someone's dog got up on their roof. But it would then get on two legs and jump to the next building. After landing, it would stay up there, sitting cross-legged, staring at her with yellow eyes. She ended up speeding home so fast that she got pulled over by the tribal police. When she explained what she saw and why she was speeding, the officer told her to be quiet, tore up the ticket he was writing, and told her to get her ass home. Uncle John came by again and performed the ritual. Jess said that according to John, the creature wasn't after her and was caught in the act of stalking someone else. That made it set its eyes upon her, so she was to be extra cautious. And this is why she stands firm by the words of, shut the fuck up about them forever. She only told Sam all of this to keep the things off her and her family. But wouldn't you know it, that just made him more interested. And who could blame him? It seems as though Sam kind of whittled down John's resolve on the issue. Because eventually, the old man budged a little bit. He revealed to Sam a few bits and pieces of information over the years. I'm just going to copy and paste from some Instagram messages he sent me. Please note that the only changes I made to his messages were the names of those involved. Also, in case it isn't obvious, Sam likes to abbreviate Skinwalker to SW. The first thing John told me about Skinwalkers was that they can't actually read minds like they say in the stories and stuff. It was basically what you'll call an old wife's tale because they didn't want their kids talking about that shit and spreading the idea that this was something people could do. I actually think they wanted the practice of being skinwalkers to die out completely. So they thought by forbidding people from talking about it, nobody would be curious enough to try out black magic and shit. I think because Denye are so steeped in oral traditions that they basically believed if enough people stopped talking about a thing, it dies forever. But you know real well that you can't tell people not to talk about something. So they said that if you talk about skinwalkers, it will make them interested in you and seek you out. It was just them trying to scare kids. The other thing is that they are just regular people, not monsters. They don't have any special powers. They just know a lot about certain things that a lot of us don't. Like how there are things you know how to do as a video guy for example. That regular people who never done it don't. Like when you show them a really cool edit you did or shots you pulled off. And they're like, how did you do that? It's the same kind of stuff. They just spend a lot of time learning about stuff that makes them able to do what they do. They studied animals and how they move. Making suits. Studied poisons. Shit like that. They're actually medicine men just like John. In fact, a lot of them are openly good medicine men in the community. And nobody knows they practice this stuff. It's just another form of their medicine men stuff. But they use it for people who want to harm or scare others. Like they get hired to fuck with people. John told me this one story about a close friend who was also a medicine man in the city area. That had an asshole in the neighborhood who kept bitching about his property lines or something like that. He was building a fence and there was a big fuss about it. The guy was harassing the shit out of his next door neighbor because of it. But the neighbor knew where his land started and ended so he didn't budge. Eventually, some weird shit started to go down. The asshole's neighbor was talking about how there was a giant coyote in his backyard that would look in the windows at night and scare the fuck out of him and his girlfriend. He would hang in his backyard with a shotgun around sundown, which of course would weird out everyone in the neighborhood and a lot of folks were saying that he was mentally unstable. But then people in the neighborhood started hearing fucked up noises and someone saw a coyote stand on its hind legs and look in the windows. Then one day, the guy's girlfriend drove him back to the emergency room because he was having a really bad trip apparently, hallucinating and talking about this coyote man who was saying that he was going to kill him. John doesn't know what he was on, if it was some kind of drug or something. He came down a few hours later 
and a lot of people in town laughed it off. But John's friend and a few other people in the neighborhood, like I assume the ones who actually saw the coyote man, knew that it was most likely a skinwalker fucking with him. John said that skinwalkers know a lot about medicine, how to get the results they want from them, and how to administer them to victims without them knowing. Like they know so much about the compounds and shit, that they know exactly how it will affect you and how to fuck with you when you're on them. So John's friend came by to bless the place and perform a ritual and the weird shit stopped. Because skinwalkers are medicine men themselves, they also believe in the power of the rituals that are used against them. That's how I would say these things work. Nothing super magical or paranormal about it. They just have strong beliefs and know what to fuck with and what not to. Anywho, so he thinks that this asshole neighbor got a skinwalker on him to get him to move out of town or something like that. The last thing John told me for a really long time was about how skinwalkers were actually good guys at one time. They created that whole practice to fuck with the colonizers. They protected other people and scared away anybody trying to take the land. But some started using the practice for their own gain, and once the treaties were signed and we got land back and all that, they just started using it to do bad stuff to other Dinye. After this, John basically closed the door on the skinwalker talk. Sam told me he thought it was weird that John didn't want to talk about them. After all, John said it himself that skinwalkers can't read minds and talking about them didn't draw their attention to you. As Sam said, it's an old wife's tale. He even told this to Jess but she shot him down. She actually kind of insulted him apparently, telling Sam that he's not a real Denye, so he doesn't understand. And him trying to get into this deep skinwalker stuff was actually offensive to their heritage. And that's part one. I will be posting the second part soon, which will begin to cover some more elements of skinwalker lore that I thought was a lot more interesting than what John initially led on. I realized that the last post presented a grounded realistic idea of the skinwalker. But this is where we start getting into some real supernatural shit. And because of that, I do want to say everything with a disclaimer that what I'm about to tell you I cannot verify. I am not Denye, and I know very few folks who are native, much less culturally native. I don't live anywhere near the four corners either. This is all from the recollection of one Denye friend of mine, who is retelling stories and information given to him by a much older man. Believe what you can, or take everything with a grain of salt. I hope it's a fun read. I'm warning you, it's much longer this time around. After learning the truth about skinwalkers and being scolded by his girlfriend, Sam took the clue and for a while focused his time spent with John on things the old man actually wanted to talk about. Sam learned a lot about his culture and the practice of medicine man and worked on this gorgeous 4x5 portrait series of elderly folks on the res. Sam told me that it was around this time that he realized he was pretty cautious in the way he approached the skinwalker subject. He was just a dumb kid raised in white America who thought he was being curious about his native culture, when actually he was spending more time chasing scary stories than actually learning about his people. By the time Sam had been living on the rest for about four or so years, he even got a full-time teaching job at one of the reservation schools. He moved out of his dad's place and got his own. Sam always had planned to move back to Illinois or to some bigger city with more of an art scene, but wanted to spend much more time on the res, at least another five years or so. Despite that desire to stay and his new job, he and Jess ended up moving to my city only a few months into his full-time position. And that's around the time that I actually met him. His usual response to why they both left was that he needed to be somewhere with a bigger art scene and community and Jess wanted to go back to school to get an MSW. But it wasn't until I got to know him well and we started bonding over our shared interest in the paranormal 
Did he actually tell me why they left? Here are the DMs that he sent me. John was getting up there in age. Late 80s. The guy lived a long life. Had some cancer in the 60s and beat it. But he would tell me that he always wondered when it would come back to take him. I think it was like in 2014 or something. As a side note, Sam moved to the res in 2010 and met John a few months after that. So he was diagnosed with lung cancer that spread to his liver, colon, and he was only given a few months to a year to live. Fucking sucked to hear because we were basically brothers by this point. For being as old as he was, he was really sharp. After being diagnosed with cancer, Jess, her father, and Sam spent a lot more time with the old man helping him around the house. At this point in his life he was only in bed and had refused to be put in hospice care as he thought it was a waste of the family's money, for as Sam put it, a more comfortable way of dying. A few months in, Sam received a call from John asking him to come over that evening. And here's the message from Sam. He told me that he had some stuff he wanted to tell me that he didn't want to die with him. I assume he felt like he was on his way out based on that. I packed my recorder in case he was okay with me recording him. When Sam arrived, John was just sitting in his porch, watching the sunset. He beckoned Sam to sit next to him and told him that he had some last bits of knowledge to share with him. When Sam mentioned that he brought his camera with him, John allowed him to film, with his only request being that he wouldn't show it to anyone and that he would stop recording when he told him to. This is what Sam sent me. We spent like an hour or so just talking about whatever came to his mind. It was a lot of stuff like I told you before. Stuff like parts of the reservation that are cursed. Pathways or portals to other dimensions. And then stuff like how to bless your home. What plants do what. How to find your way home if you're lost in the desert. Also some songs and prayers that I had to have on tape because it was in the language and I'm actually trash at it. It was like he was trying to cover everything he felt like he hadn't told me before, as he never actually passed on his knowledge to one before. He said he was keeping some knowledge for himself, but he still wanted to share what he felt comfortable with. It was here that I asked Sam why John would tell his great niece's boyfriend from Chicago out of this, if it's supposed to be secrets and stuff that stay within the Dania people. It's a little bit different than that, like I did a lot for him, renovated his home, built him a patio, even helped him get internet, and gave him my old MacBook and showed him how to use it. I gave him my old Wii, and he became fucking obsessed with Wii Sports, pretty sure he felt like he owed me because of everything I helped him with, and I always refused to take a single penny. I get why it seems weird, but... Also, I feel like he didn't have anyone interested enough to just sit down and hear him talk for hours on end. So I guess he appreciated me for that or something. Or maybe he was actually just fucking with me. But I doubt it. He was pretty sharp in his old age and also was a genuine guy. After the sun went down, John requested that they turn off the camera and go inside. Once inside, he told Sam to turn on the TV and raise the volume. He explained that it was important that no one hear their conversation. According to Sam, the old man didn't have any neighbors for miles, so he actually found that strange, at least until he learned what their conversation was about. I haven't been honest with you about Yina Droshi, he said. He then requested that Sam burn some plants, herbs, mixtures of some sort that he had to put on top of the logs in his fireplace. This was so that according to John, no one in this world, or the other, could hear them. It seems, and this is just Sam's reading of the situation, that John thought by writing skinwalkers off as just assholes who dress in animal skins and drug people with shrooms to fuck with them, he would discourage the young man from ever looking any further into the legends. And while that was definitely true, there were skinwalkers who had no powers, no connection with the supernatural, 
and were just Danya fanatics who played dress up. That was only part of the story. Yinadroshis exist in two different natures. The first kind, John had already explained to Sam. Medicine man with no actual supernatural powers, just a very extensive knowledge of various medicine compounds, able to craft very convincing outfits of animal pelts and can move and behave very similar to whatever animal they wish to mimic. These folks were accessible to the general population on the res. When I say accessible, of course, I don't mean just anyone can seek them out. It takes someone well connected. These skinwalkers would often receive monetary compensation for their deeds. They based this entire practice on the legends of the shapeshifters and dark witches in Denye folklore. This explains a good portion of skinwalker stories and lore that you see posted online. Large coyotes or sheep behaving strange, only to, upon closer inspection, reveal that they are a person wearing animal skins. But what about the other stories? The stories of these creatures, half man, half beast, pulling off on natural speeds around the res, running alongside cars at top speed, mimicking voices reading and even controlling minds, immune to firearms, shape-shifting into incredibly convincing, terrifying wolf-like creatures, glowing red or yellow eyes and faces that are not human or animal. Well, you guessed it. Those are real Yinadroshis, powerful, dark witches who have scared the Denye and sometimes others, for centuries. John said that skinwalkers developed around the time when the first colonizers arrived. Medicine men and the tribes were incredibly cautious of these visitors, and as time went on, they revealed themselves to be conquerors. The medicine man, as Sam put it, turned to the dark side in order to scare them off Medicine men back then knew that by turning to the practice of black magic, there wasn't really any turning back. Black magic robs them of humanity and corrupts their souls. But they believed that they could do this for the good of their people. And then, once the colonizers were driven out, be dealt with by their own people. In fact, some medicine men revealed their plans for this to other members of their practice who opted not to participate in the rituals. They gave them detailed instructions on how to protect themselves and even kill them when necessary. Unfortunately, we know how this turned out. And now, we have the unique Denia problem of the skinwalkers. And unlike the other skinwalkers, the pretenders in animal fur, these Yinadroshis are not human or at least not in the sense that is recognized by the Denye. In order to become one of these things, they must participate in a ceremony that essentially robs them of their humanity, and after a long enough time living as one of them, they barely even resemble a human in appearance. Think of the Wendigo, a creature that was once human, but through some horrific, twisted process or ritual, became something else. The practice of being a skinwalker is guarded even more so than that of the pretenders. It requires committing horrible acts, murder, or torture of a family member or friend, ingesting poisons and human flesh, and communicating with entities from other dimensions. Skinwalkers are also a people unto themselves, an isolated subculture of the Denye that branched off a long time ago. Even though they make their home in the same region as the Denye, they generally do not live among them. They are a completely separate community. John did not go into great detail on the process of becoming a skinwalker. He said no man who calls himself Denye would ever know such things. That might have been true a century ago when skinwalkers still lived among the people but in this day and age, the skinwalker is much too concerned with being found out. 
and so they isolate themselves and brought all knowledge with them. Think of those tribes that are still being discovered in the jungles of Africa and South America, completely cut off from the rest of the world. Only this tribe is aware of the rest of the people and actually chooses to isolate. That all being said, of course, they still do go out among the people. It's just always at night, among only a small group of folks, and only for their own dark purposes. Exactly what skinwalkers gain from their behavior towards the Denye is disrupted among medicine men. John's understanding was that, aside from stealing livestock, their abilities feed off the fear that they instill in others and to their connection to whatever dark entities. But somebody dying directly at the hands of a skinwalker is extremely rare. John then went on to say how a lot of things that are sometimes attributed to deaths of despair, such as suicide, overdose, alcohol poisoning, etc., could be traced to very powerful skinwalkers. It said that a basic trait of the skinwalker is being able to instill fear in their victims, like a weak form of mind control. More powerful skinwalkers can actually cause folks to harm themselves. However, John wasn't sure if the mind control rumors were true. The powder of a corpse, the fable favorite weapon of the skinwalker, blown on their victims' faces, could actually be how they make these things happen. While some say that the powder of a corpse is a powerful poison that slowly kills over the course of a few days, leaving no trace of itself in one system. I heard of things like this before. Criminals in some parts of South America use something similar to make their marks essentially empty their bank accounts for them. John believes in both of these explanations. It is sometimes a cocktail of poison and human bone and sometimes it's a drug and the skinwalker uses this to instruct the victim to harm or kill themselves somehow. Having contact directly with their victims is too risky both for the individual skinwalker as well as their clan and is likely frowned upon. When a skinwalker does physically kill someone the person either disappears or has their body found much later with their death ruled as an animal attack. John says that this is more common among weaker skinwalkers. One detail that stood out to Sam was the idea that skinwalkers communicate with other entities from other dimensions. And he pressed John on this a bit more. In Sam's words, he knew I was raised Catholic, so he explained them to me as basically being demons. I don't remember what it was, but even if I did, I most likely couldn't spell it. They are evil, inhuman spirits that try and come into our realm, or dimension, or plane, or whatever, but don't exactly have a physical presence, so they possess people, or in the case of skinwalkers. They use them as their connection to this world, so some skinwalkers do the bidding of demons, and in return, the demons give them powers. But John also said that some really old skinwalkers aren't even people anymore. They're only living as empty vessels, but demons live inside them. I guess the idea is that demons give them powers in exchange for letting the demon possess their body by using it as their flesh puppet after they die. According to John, they communicate with these beings through their knowledge of the portal system in the America Southwest. This included places that are off the reservation. Even though skinwalkers are careful about going off the res, as it can be more densely populated and carries with it a risk of being discovered, the few times they do, they are good at keeping a low profile, being actual shapeshifters and all. But because of their nature, they can't resist feeding off the fear of others. So small groups of campers and people driving alone at night off the res have stories as well. Sometimes lone visitors outside the reservation, but that are close to a portal, who are off camping, hiking, will straight up disappear under weird circumstances. 
This may be a stretch, but this reminded me of David's missing 411 research. I highly doubt skinwalkers are to blame for the majority of these mysterious disappearances. But what if John is saying is true? A few of them could have possibly fallen prey to one. These portals often exist in caves and small canyons and require a full ritual, offerings, dances, and a sacrifice to open. What the sacrifice is, John isn't sure, but he guesses that disappearing hikers may have something to do with it. When the portals open, they are used for different things, communicating with spirits and demons, gaining more power, summoning other entities into our world, or even throwing themselves or others into the portals and leaving this world. Sam asked why they would go into the portals and what existed beyond them. It was another dimension that allowed them to observe our world but not interact with it, as well as see things and beings that we cannot see or interact with in our own plane. He said that they would interact in that dimension with these things called Chendis, which are the evil spirits of those deceased said to be a manifestation of everything that was bad about a person. They would send Chendis out to not only harm others and spread illness, but also report on which people were growing wise to the skinwalkers. This was where the belief that skinwalkers are not to be discussed come from. Chendis can listen to your conversations and report back to the skinwalkers who commune with them, and then using portals, show them where the offending individual lived. It was very important to the skinwalkers that much of the general population know nothing about them, their culture, their practices, and most importantly, who they are. Nowadays, of course, because skinwalkers isolate, protecting their identities was not as crucial, as anyone who saw their original forms would never be able to recognize them as they were not members of the community. But John noted that there were select skinwalkers who would live alongside the communities, and sometimes in them, as a way of feeding off others' energy without directly stalking or scaring them. He told me a little story about this group of folks who lived near a weird old witch. This was back in the 1980s, I think. She would come into town but never buy anything from the stores or the markets or anything like that. Just walk around, stare at people. One day, a guy and his wife went into one of the cities off the rest for the weekend. And while they were at a restaurant, they saw her looking through the window at them. I actually painted this scene a while back. So they were wondering how the fuck she got out there and it scared the shit out of them. Like she just lived in a hogan and she didn't even have a car. She ended up disappearing and that night the wife had a dream that the old lady had gone down on all fours and turned into a fucked up looking coyote. On their way back to the res the next evening they saw what they thought was an injured coyote on the side of the road. The husband was gonna get out to see what was up but the wife made him stop. The coyote was looking straight at her with the same stare that she saw in the old woman's eyes. It leapt up on its hind legs and ran off. The next day, the wife told everyone she could that the old lady was a skinwalker. Rumor has it that the old witch got sick and died the next day. Do take notice of the words, rumor has it. Many people believe that if you learn and tell others of a skinwalker's identity, it can spell disaster for them, and it's one of the few ways an average person can kill them. However, this is only partially true. It weakens the skinwalker by not only robbing them of their prey, but it doesn't kill them. But what does actually kill them? Other skinwalkers. According to John, the woman did not die of a random sudden illness. She simply left town. He believes to go back to her local skinwalker community. However, the next day she was found, not far from her own Hogan, 
dead and mauled by a pack of animals, wolf bites, bear claw marks, and even evidence of being trampled by a horse were found on her body. When the authorities found the body, a local medicine man, whom John actually knew, instructed the police to say that she died of an illness. He wanted people to remain unaware that a community of skinwalkers was in their midst, so no curious, stupid folks would go looking for them. And that's part two. I'll post part three tomorrow. Third part will go into detail on why Sam left the reservation. So again, full disclaimer, I cannot verify any of these stories. Believe what you can, or take it all with a grain of salt. So if skinwalkers are, say for a select few, an isolated group, how do they add more to their ranks? They used to be easier to join, like if you were a medicine man and knew how to find them and had completed the first ritual on your own. They will let you go through the rituals and train you. You have to complete the first ritual before even looking for the skinwalkers. That way they know that you reached the point of no return. John said that he didn't know the actual rituals, but he assumed it was the part where you kill a close friend or family member. So you couldn't really go back to your regular way of living. And so you robbed yourself of your humanity too. It's how they know that you're real. Otherwise, they just kill you on the spot. John told Sam he had no idea how skinwalkers were recruited. The most likely scenario would most likely be kidnapping someone very young and grooming them to murder the family they were taken from or choosing to share their knowledge with people that the demons have scouted out as a spirit and potential addition to their ranks. It should be noted that according to John, pretenders almost never became real skinwalkers. No info on why. Sam and I guess that they most likely want the pretenders to do their thing and continue to exist to throw folks off their trail. Finally, John had one last piece of information to share. Yes, these skinwalkers actually did transform into animals and it was often to varying degrees of success. The more skilled skinwalkers could mimic an animal perfectly to the point where you wouldn't be able to pick them out among a pack. But the issue is, a normal old coyote or sheep isn't scary if it looks and behaves exactly as it should. So skinwalkers on purpose transform into imperfect or unnatural creatures. Things such as larger size, weird proportions, even human features mixed in. One story that stood out to me in regards to the way skinwalkers present, mainly because it had to do with the infamous Skinwalker Ranch. My personal least favorite skinwalker story because it sounds so ridiculous and is barely even about actual skinwalkers. Okay, so first of all, let me say I think Skinwalker Ranch is mostly bullshit. John's heard the stories and says it's white people crap. People say it's land is cursed by Denye because it was stolen from us and they think we got a skinwalker on it. But we know that's not possible because they exist separate to the Denye and we can't summon them. But there was a skinwalker on the land. Several, most likely. A tribe of skinwalkers that just refused to leave. So people said it was a Denye curse. But most of the crazy UFO shit just doesn't track with me or John. Maybe some of it because Denny have seen shit, but I don't know, a lot of it sounds bunk. But anyways, the reason I bring up Skinwalker Ranch is because one of the stories from the white people who lived there was that they saw this big ass wolf, like bigger than any wolf in existence, the size of a horse maybe. This was actually true, I'm sure of it at least. They most likely added the UFO stuff for fun because just saying you saw a big wolf isn't a crazy enough story. But this wolf is an example of how they'll become a real animal. But they'll add some detail that doesn't add up 
or doesn't look right and actually makes it 10 times scarier. And sometimes the transformations aren't perfect anyways and they keep it that way instead of trying to perfect it. There was this other story I heard online, most likely about a guy who saw a giant Doberman looking thing with yellow eyes but looked like it had bits of flesh hanging off almost like a zombie dog. I don't know how true the story is, but it does point out this characteristic. What happens when a skinwalker absorbs the skin of the animal they kill, but it's not a perfect animal, or the skin has started to decompose before they absorb it, but it looks scary as fuck so they don't mind. I bet some of them even wait for the flesh to rot before it's absorbed. What Sam is talking about here is how they transform. Basically, they can only transform into animals they kill themselves. They must skin the animal and cover themselves in the pelt, often while it is still warm and bloody. After a certain period of time, the animal skin will be absorbed by the skinwalker, and not only will they gain the ability to transform into the animal at will, but some of the features of the beast will begin to show in the skinwalker's human form. This is how many older skinwalkers, as they age, begin to gradually lose human features, only to be replaced with more animal ones. Their human skin ages, even decays, while their animal skin does not, remaining in the same state it was when they absorbed it. This is where the stench of decay that many associate with skinwalkers comes from. It's the human being, rotting. John began noticing that the fire was dying down, and it was getting late. He told Sam that he is not to speak a word of what he was told while on the reservation. The only way in which their speech was protected from the prying demons was the mixture in the fireplace, and the blessings that John had performed earlier in the day. The loud TV was there just in case anyone, human or skinwalker, was in the area and walked by to listen. He gave Sam a small wooden box filled with the same mixture he threw on the fire, as well as a few other various things that John said would protect him. He told Sam not to take his possessions of these things as some sort of free ticket to talk freely about skinwalkers. However, he said something about how he had many decades of experience in these matters and felt safe, plus he was gonna die soon. So if a skinwalker took him out of his misery, so be it. Sam didn't have that luck, so he needed to walk on the side of caution. Off the res, he was free to blab all he wanted about the shapeshifters, because as Sam said, who the fuck would believe me anyways? The next day, as Sam was getting ready to pack up and leave school, he received a call from John. Shouldn't have told you that stuff, he said, and then told him not to come by the property for a few days. He assured Sam that he had everything taken care of and was safe, but wanted to be sure. He hung up before Sam could even get a word in. He let Jess know what her great uncle had said over the phone, and naturally, Jess had to know what it was John told him about. Sam, hesitating, told her point blank that John had given him more info on the skinwalkers. He did not go into any level of detail on what it was John said, out of respect for the old man's wishes. Jess, according to Sam, went pale. It's so weird seeing your partner who you know is a big skeptic get scared by something like this, but I guess it just goes back to being raised Denya, hearing these stories and stuff. Also, just because you're agnostic doesn't mean you just don't have some belief in the paranormal. She told me that John most likely attracted someone's attention by talking about that shit, but that we have to trust that he knows what he's doing. And then she told me I can't speak a single word of what I heard, and I am never to ask or even allow John to tell me anything anymore. She said something like words have power, you're not culturally then yet, so you wouldn't get it. She laid into me a bit after that. I was kind of insulted, but in retrospect, she was right. It hurts to hear, 
but I think we all gotta take a step back. But Jess, alarmed that she was, put her trust in John and told Sam that they weren't to contact or visit his property until he said everything was okay, but that day never came. Two nights later, Sam and Jess were awoken by a phone call from Jess's father. John was in the hospital. His body was taking a turn for the worse. The two rushed to the hospital, but John had passed away of a heart attack before they got there. For a while after John's passing, Sam, Jess, and their families lived in a pretty uneventful life. Sam thinks it was a period of about three or four months of relative calm. Jess had started looking into getting an MSW out of state, and Sam was grappling with a decision of whether or not he wanted to stay on the res or follow Jess wherever she would go. I asked Sam if there was any tension between him and Jess because of everything that happened, but he said they both sort of dropped the entire argument about Sam messing with Skinwalker knowledge. He does not think that Jess attributes what happened to John as a result of bringing Skinwalker attention onto him. After these three to four months of calm were up, strange things began happening to Jess's family members. Her father, mother, and younger brother all complained of a group of coyotes that ran around their property, keeping them up several nights a week with their noises and scratching on the side of the house. Her father had taken to standing on the porch with a shotgun some nights, but he never saw anything. Her cousin complained about missing livestock. They would completely disappear, but every once in a while, the corpse of a cow would be found a few yards from the property. Sometimes it was a cow that was missing days earlier and looked only freshly slaughtered. Then one night, Sam was staying over at Jess's house. While they were having dinner, Sam noticed it had gotten quiet outside. He told me it was windy outside. When all of a sudden, the wind could not be heard. And that's when he actually heard something tapping on the window. Jess pointed at the window behind Sam. When he turned around to look, he caught a glimpse of a figure for only a split second before it vanished. But he could hear it walking away from the window as the thing was very close to the house. The two were frozen in fear for a few seconds before the sound of the wind returned. They drew the blinds. Sam said they barely slept that night. Jess told him that she saw a large wolf with glowing yellow eyes looking into their window. She said it was a weird looking wolf and that it was smiling, almost like how a man smiles. There was a row of yellow teeth that looked strange like human teeth. Jess found herself in the coming days bothered by this. She told Sam it reminded her all too well of the two beings she saw all those years ago. They had someone come by the property to bless it and that was that for everything that transpired at Jess's home. A few weeks after the incident, Sam was awoken by a series of noises. The noises, he said, started far away, but were loud enough to wake him up. He said they grew in volume as they grew closer. He estimated that there were about a minute or so in between. Each noise was getting closer. From far away, they sounded like your typical wolf or dog, but as they got closer, they sounded more bizarre. As he said it, it's really hard to say exactly why these noises were so scary. Like, I was shivering in fear. Wave after wave and after wave of chills, dude. My eyes were watering. I felt like I was having a panic episode. They didn't sound like any animals I knew. It started like a wolf howl, but then made weird gurgly noises that went on for a few more seconds after. The noises were really loud at the front end, violent, like they were a warning. Suddenly, Sam heard a noise from inside his own home. He tells me he grabbed his pistol from his closet and burst through his bedroom door only to see an empty house with the front and back doors wide open, swaying in the wind. 
Looking out the back door, he said he saw two wolves running away in the moonlight, but their gait was off as though they had the wrong set of hind legs. The next day, Sam dialed the medicine man who blessed Jess's place. He was an old friend of John's. When he came by, he first listened to Sam's story and then inspected the home. The medicine man, in a sort of roundabout way, told him it was indeed a yinadroshi and that he had caught the attention of something very old very powerful and very evil in fact the medicine man had never heard of any being of the sort to actually enter another person's dwelling place that fact alone terrified the man enough to where he said i don't know what my blessing will do best case scenario it'll keep it off your property it won't keep it off you worst case scenario it'll make it Man, I thought, shit, well, it was worth it just to try for the possibility of it working, I guess. How fucked up is all this? Sam also showed the man the box of items that John had given him to see if they held any significance. The man frowned, saying he didn't wish to speak ill of the dead. But John had made a small error in giving Sam what he thought were things that would protect him. The man went to his truck and came back with another item. Sam won't tell me what the items were. This is out of respect for the Dinya traditions. He also says that he didn't even know what half of the stuff was. So the medicine man told Sam to put that with the other things, but that it was no guarantee. He said there was no one size fits all solution to warding off dark witches. Witches, which by the way, is how he refers to skinwalkers. So witches are superstitious, but some more than others. Some of them have learned that certain practices don't do anything, so they just laugh those off, while some others find it actually disrespectful. Finally, he performed a blessing. He told Sam that if things don't improve, he may need to get help from someone else, or multiple others and then he gave him the info of some other medicine man whom he trusted he closed out by saying that john was most likely the best person he knew how to deal with these things in spite of the slip up with the items he gave sam that night sam said he was sleeping peacefully which continued for about a week then one night sam woke up to use the bathroom he didn't switch on any lights, but noticed two very strange things. For one, it was freezing. We live in the desert, but it's never been that cold at night, that time of year. And I didn't have the AC on because I'm not a diva like you. And also, it fucking reeked. His house smelled of rotting flesh. After using the bathroom, he went back to bed and then had an incredibly vivid dream six tall lanky skinned men in animal pelts wearing skulls with bits of flesh still clinging to them he remembers them clear as day two appear to be dressed as wolves one as a sheep one as a coyote and another as a deer with broken antlers they were standing around all glaring at him with striking yellow eyes they barely moved. In the words of Sam, they looked like people who hadn't eaten in weeks, almost zero body fat or muscle, and one of them did not look well. The deer man, I'm talking about gray skin, infections, almost like a zombie. It was disgusting. Sam woke up in a cold sweat. He told me that in the dream, he was just standing there as their eyes bore into him. He actually knew he was dreaming while it was happening. His first and so far only instance of lucid dreaming. He told me of how desperate he wanted to wake up, but he couldn't. When he left his room, he saw five sets of footprints in dirt. There were no footprints leading to where they actually were. Just five sets of footprints, as though something had just appeared 
and disappeared in one spot out of thin air. There were also six men in his dream, but he never found the other set of footprints, assuming that these prints belonged to the man in his dream. When he told the medicine man about this, he was rightfully baffled and terrified. He told Sam to call the others, but that he doubted the effectiveness of their practices in light of the information that he shared. He still offered a blessing, which Sam accepted. Sam did indeed make a few calls and told several other medicine men about what happened. They told him that something very dark had set its eyes on him and that he was to be very cautious. He basically lived with Jess until the semester ended, only going home to grab something every once in a while. Sam moved back to the Chicago area for a brief period before Jess started her first semester for her masters in another city where he joined her. That's around the time we met on a gig while he was working as a freelance photographer. Whether he left or not because of the encounters and the dream He's never really actually said. I know he was looking to live in a city with an arts community, but I do think the encounters were the straw that broke the camel's back. Sam says that he doesn't know if he wants to return to the res, but he still goes every now and then to see his dad. I'm sure the skinwalkers miss him greatly. It was late June of 1968. My dad was 12. My grandparents had moved a few months earlier from Tucson, Arizona to Concho, Arizona. Concho was very different, both in landscape and temperature. Sitting at 5,000 feet above sea level, the summer temperatures were around 70 degrees versus the hundreds in summertime Tucson. Resting at the edge of the White Mountains, the land is red, yellow, and brown sandstone cliffs and buttes against a larger ancient basalt flow ridge that lines the north from the Springville Volcanic Range. Well, Old Concho, as it's referred to now, sits among the high desert with large basalt ridge bordering the east and north. In the valley, a dry riverbed was dotted by large cottonwood trees. The buttes and ridges boasted large twisted cedar trees. Only about 200 people lived in Concho at the time. It's in pretty close proximity to the petrified forest. Therefore, petrified wood was found on the valley floor. There were also numerous ancient Anasasi ruins scattered along the valley. My great uncle had moved his family to Concho as well. My grandpa had recently finished his engineering degree and he and my great uncle were doing highway construction all around the White Mountains. They had both purchased land in the Concho area for pretty cheap. My great uncle had two sons who were a year older and a year younger than my dad, Tony and Sack. Tony was 13 and Sack was 11. They would spend their days exploring the surrounding landscapes, joined by my dad's American bulldog, Sarge. They had found quite a few ruins, numerous pictographs, and some old abandoned homesteads, most likely from the 19th century. Every morning, they would load up their bags with canteens, bologna sandwiches, and head out into the wilderness to play and explore. My grandparents and great aunt and uncles had only one rule that was for the children, and that was to return by sunset. As my dad recalls on one summer morning, they ended up hiking towards the edge of the giant basalt ridge to explore. After going for about a mile or so, they came upon an arroyo running adjacent to the ridge. Large black boulders and giant slabs of sandstone peppered the wash. The banks were pretty steep, but they would have to cross it 
if they want to explore the ridge on the other side. They made their way down slowly. Once in the arroyo, they realized that the opposite bank was too steep to climb. So they started following it west to find a better place to climb up. My dad said as soon as they got into the riverbed, he started getting an unnerving feeling, like they were being watched. He said it was extremely quiet. No birds or cicadas chirping. It was hot as well. No breeze stirred the air. The further they walked down the wash, the more a sense of urgency began to build in his gut. He didn't say anything though, for fear that his cousins would laugh at him. About a half mile or so down the wash, it made a bend around a large volcanic boulder. Suddenly, Sarge began a low growl, hair standing up on his back. This actually startled all three of the kids. Looking around, they didn't see anything. So encouraging the dog, they moved closer to the bend. Sarge stayed rooted to the spot, growling and barking. All three of the boys began to get scared. They agreed that maybe they should just turn around. They noticed that there was a spot where they could climb out of the wash. They hadn't noticed it at first, but it looked almost like a game trail. With adrenaline fueling them, they hauled ass up the side of the embarkment towards the ridge, the dog darting after them. The whole time the bad feeling was growing stronger with my dad. They stopped at the top to catch their breath. Sitting against a large boulder, they took some drinks from the canteen and assured each other that Sarge probably smelled a coyote or spotted a rabbit. Here, the game trail was more apparent. It had even worn into some of the volcanic and sandstone that protruded from the ground. They noticed that there were a lot of petroglyphs dotting the black rocks, geometric shapes, animal, human figures. There were so many. Finally, they found a large juniper with a trunk and ate their lunch in shade. Bellies full and excitement replacing fear. They hurry along the trail as it slowly sigged and sagged the side of the basalt ridge, avoiding large areas of rock falls. The pictographs began to change as well along the trails. Lots of spirals and horned looking men. My dad even said there was one that looked like a UFO. Turning around a bend, the trail disappeared. Only open space of the edge of a cliff. There was nowhere else to go. The cliff dropped off to one side, and a sheer cliff going up about 50 feet on the other side. My dad, he was disappointed, but also a little relieved, as the sun was getting further west, and they were pretty far from Concho now. They could see the town in the distance, as well as the holy mountain and mesas that dotted the distant Navajo Res. Even though they were disappointed, they decided that it was worth looking at the view. They started making their way down the trail when they spotted an opening in the cliffside, a side canyon. They hadn't noticed it on the way up. It was behind a large twisted cedar. The tree's shadow had hidden it. It looked almost like there was another trail going into the divide. The opening was about four feet wide. Looking at it, that unnerving feeling returned to my dad. His stomach dropped and he felt like it was twisting in knots. The hair on the back neck stood up. Tony suggested that they should detour and check it out. My dad protested saying that they needed to get back. Zach stayed silent. He looked as scared as my dad felt. Tony laughed when looking at them and called them both sissies. He said if they didn't want to go, it was fine, that they could wait there for him and be babies if they wanted. That's when Sarge ran down the trail and was out of sight. My dad whistled for him, but he didn't return. Zach decided he would follow Tony, so my dad stayed behind while they entered the narrow black walled canyon. When they moved out of my dad's field of vision, the wind picked up blowing through the canyon and trees, making a creepy sound. It was quiet except the wind, and my dad thought he heard faint voices on the air. He shivered, 
the ominous feeling growing stronger. Ten minutes passed, then twenty, and still, Tony and Zack had not returned. A large cloud had covered the sun, and drops of rain began to fall. My dad moved under the cedar to get out of the light rain that began to fall. He sat on a rock and began to shiver. Suddenly, something grabbed his shoulder. He jumped about three feet and screamed. Then he heard laughing. It was Tony and Zack. They looked extremely excited. Luke, you'll never believe what we found. They said, we found some Indian steps and they lead to a cave. They begged my dad to come see. It wasn't far, only about 10 minutes into the canyon. My dad ended up following them, knowing they weren't going to agree to go home until they showed them. Plus, he felt a little braver and more intrigued now. Sure enough, around a bend and about 20 yards into the canyon, the canyon was more wide, about 20 to 30 feet across, and there were indeed foot and hand holds carved into the rock wall. My dad had seen steps like them before when his parents had taken him to Chaco Canyon National Park. They were smaller than the ones in Chaco and only went up about 20 feet to the darkened mouth of a small cave. He shivered from excitement or fear. He wasn't sure. From the bottom of the canyon, there was no way of telling how large the cave was. They dropped their packs and decided to use the foot and hand holds to climb up to the cave against my dad's better judgment. The rain had stopped, but they slowly and carefully made their way because the rock had become slick. It took about 10 minutes to ascend. My dad called for Sarge from the top again, and the dog still hadn't returned. The cave was much larger and deeper than they expected and the entrance was decorated with hundreds of petroglyphs. The light didn't penetrate very far in, but they could see light in the distance from an opening in the roof. So they entered. Light adjusting to the dark, they started to notice that the ground was covered with objects. What looked like rocks and debris now revealed itself to be pots, beautiful painted pots of all shapes and sizes black on white, painted with geometric patterns, and animals, red pots and even some yellow ones, large pots holding dry corn and crusty squash and beans. There were also pots filled with arrowheads and beads. They even found some instruments like drums and flutes. They didn't touch anything and kept walking deeper into the cave. They looked around in shock and in awe. They had just discovered something big, something very big. They moved now towards the second bit of light streaming in from a crack in the roof. The cave was littered with all sorts of artifacts, stone axes, pots of all shapes, colors, and sizes. As they passed under the crack, they noticed now that there were objects and alcoves in the wall. My dad moved closer to one and his blood froze. He was looking at a human body. It was decayed skin and hair clinging to patches and its mouth open and what looked like a silent scream. He took a leap back. Tony and Zack also froze. The walls were lined with alcoves filled with dressed bodies, lining the walls as far as they could see into the darkness. Suddenly, an ominous and horrendous screech broke the silence of the cave. All three boys jumped, and my dad, looking in the direction from where the sound came, saw two red and glowing eyes. He froze, locked in place by those glowing red eyes. Suddenly, the cave was washed over with the stench of decay and death. The eyes began to move towards the boys. Slowly, another hideous growl, screech, jolted them from being petrified in place. The eyes were moving fast now, right towards them. 
and they heard what sounded like running footsteps. They turned and tore out of the cave as fast as they could. They ran as fast as their legs could carry them in a blind panic. The entrance to the cave was maybe 30 yards away. My dad looked back against his better judgment and saw a man on all fours or a giant coyote. He can't be sure. He pushed himself faster, screaming for the others to also run faster. They reached the edge of the cave, having to turn around to scrabble back down the foot and handholds. Zack got there first and began descending as fast as he could. Tony was next. His face turned into a wash of horror as he went down. My dad's heart was hammering into his brain by now. He turned and saw the eyes only about 20 feet from him. The stench of decay was overpowering. It made his stomach turn. As fast as he could, he placed his feet in the first set of footholds and started clambering down the rock face. He could hear the creature's breath now and even feel it. He refused to look up as he was going down, trying to concentrate on the hand and footholds. He heard Tony scream from below him and looked to see Tony lose his hold and slip about five feet from the bottom. He landed on his side and began to scream with pain. My dad slowed himself a bit, still not daring to look back up. After what seemed like an eternity, he leaped from the cliffside down the last two feet. Zack was helping Tony to his feet, and Tony was frozen looking at the cave and ancient staircase. All the color gone from his face. My dad was in full panic and not looking, grabbed Tony and helped Zack drag him away. They flew down the little canyon. Finally, before they passed the turn, my dad looked back to see the red eyes watching them from the darkness. Another screech rang from the cave, and at that moment, Sarge and a full run came from around the bend, growling and barking. He ran to the foot and handhold staircase and bellow up that cave the hair on his back standing straight up, snarling and growling. The sounds of the dog filled the canyon. As my dad turned the corner, he saw those red eyes retreat back into the cave. They emerged from the small canyon and stopped briefly to catch their breath. The sounds of Sarge barking and growling echoing down the canyon. Tony at this point was now crying, his face washed with pain. His arm, he said, he thinks he broke it. Zack was silent. My dad was then asking Tony if he could make it home. Tony responded. He sure the hell wasn't staying anywhere near whatever that was. Suddenly, a shrill cry came from the canyon. It was a dog in pain. Sarge, my dad cried. But Tony and Zack had started running down the trail. My dad screamed again tears coming from his eyes. There was no response. It was quiet. My dad thinks he hears something. He looks up to the canyon entrance. It sounds like drums. My dad sits there confused. Drums? What the hell? Is he losing his mind? The drums are getting loud. Is this in his mind? Where is Sarge? He can't leave him. My dad sees Sag tearing back up the trail. Luke, we have to go. The drums are louder now, and he can hear faint chanting. Zack grabs my dad and jerks him to his feet. Don't you hear that? He screams and shakes my dad. We have to run, now. My dad is woken from his grief, as fear washes over him again. He runs down the trail with Zack. Tony is waiting at the edge of the arroyo, waiting for them. The wash is now running, about six inches deep. They notice for the first time that a large thunderhead has developed to the south. A huge large black storm dominating the southern horizon. Lightning flashing in the distance. A new source of danger crosses my dad's mind. He tells Tony and Zack they need to cross the arroyo as fast as possible. If it floods, they will be stuck on the side with the basalt ridge with whatever that thing was. They make their way down carefully and slowly. Tony is having a hard time because of his injured arm. They now start hearing thunder rolling across the air and the wind has increased. 
My dad is keeping a close eye on the creek, which has only risen a couple of more inches. They make all the way down and across the creek. The place where they crossed is only 30 yards or so ahead, so they scrabble their way towards it. The water starts rising now at an alarming rate. They start going as fast as their legs will carry them. They're exhausted, but keep pushing on. Suddenly, my dad who is in the rear starts to hear loud splashing coming from behind him. His heart drops. It followed them. It's getting closer. He closes his eyes, bracing for impact. That's when he feels something lick the back of his swinging hand. He turns, bracing for impact, and sees Sarge. Joy fills my dad. He bends down and gives Sarge a quick hug as the dog runs past, and the dog bounds after Tony and Zack as they climb out of the arroyo. My dad runs and begins to climb. When he's almost to the top, he hears crashing and loud snapping coming from the arroyo. Making it to the top, he sees a wave of brown debris, filled water crash through the wash. He falls to his butt and watches as the flash flood fills the little canyon. Tony and Zack are lying on the ground, gasping for air. My dad tries to catch his breath. He feels dizzy. He feels tears welling up and Sarge comes and licks his face. My dad sees that Sarge is covered with blood. He looks over the dog and finds several slash wounds on his back. His ear is also torn. They don't look too deep, but he can't be sure. Zack is the first to speak. He is asking what it was, but no one responds. Tony's arm is beginning to swell pretty badly, and it's only a few hours till dusk. They're all thirsty, and realize in their panic, they left their packs in the small canyon along with their canteens. They are no longer in a hurry. They are exhausted. They drink some rainwater that has pooled in one of the large sandstone boulders. They figure whatever that thing was, it's not going to be getting across the arroyo for a few hours. So they slowly make their way back to Concho as the Thunderhead to the south continues to fill the landscape. The three boys and Sarge make it home around eight the sun has set, and my grandparents and great uncle and aunt are worry sick. They are relieved and angry until they see the condition of the trio and the dog. The boys tell them about their horrendous tale, and Tony's parents rush Tony to the nearest doctor. That night, my dad sleeps with Sarge at the end of his bed. Despite him being extremely exhausted, he is plagued with nightmares. One that he speaks about all the time is especially terrifying where he sees the red eyes looking in through his window. When he wakes up though, in the morning, his curtains are closed. The rain continues for two or three days. The boys don't leave their homes, still terrified of what happened. My grandpa and great uncle are convinced what the boys encounter was a mountain lion but they are intrigued by the story of the cave they found. A few days later, when the weather is clear, they tell the boys they want to see the cave. They make the journey faster this time, using my great uncle's jeep. My grandpa and great uncle also bring along a couple of shotguns and rifles in case this lion is still in the cave. The boys show them the arroyo which has been filled with new boulders and broken trees from the flooding. They find the trail and start making their way up. My grandpa on the front and great uncle taking the rear. They find the boys packs caught in a cedar bush. They have been shredded. My grandpa figures they must have been caught by another flood and they ended up in the trees. They finally make it to the little hidden canyon which has been blocked by a juniper that washed down during the rain. My grandpa and great uncle get the log out of the way and they go to the canyon to the Indian staircase. When they look up though, they can make out the darkness of the cave. The water washed away all signs of the boy's previous passage. My grandpa figures maybe at this time of day, 
the cave is more illuminated. So he and my great uncle climb up the foot and handholds to the top. The boys wait at the bottom, having no desire to go back up there again. It's only my dad and Zack. Tony with his broken arm stayed home. My grandpa calls down for them to climb up. They do as they are told and climb up. When my dad reaches the top, he is stunned. The cave is gone. It's only a 20 foot rock alcove next to a black basalt cliff covered with petroglyphs. He's confused, looks around. He goes over to the wall looking for cracks and sees nothing. My grandpa and great uncle end up questioning the boys. Were they making up stories? No, they weren't. Something attacked Sarge and the boys hadn't made up being that scared. The dads aren't mad. It's a neat area. Maybe some other weekend they will look for the cave again. My dad and Zach know that this is where the cave was. There is no doubt in their minds. They found their packs and even passed by the UFO petroglyph. But they can't convince the adults. So they make their way to the jeep that is parked on the far bank of the Arroyo. As they load up, sun sinking low in the western sky. My dad looks back at the black basalt ridge, wondering if maybe it was all just a dream, but something in the shadow of a cliff catches his eye. He squints against the sun and sees two red shining eyes looking back at him. His blood goes cold. He turns around as the jeep pulls away. My grandparents only stayed in Concho for another few months. As soon as my grandpa finished the highway project, he got a job offer in the US Virgin Islands. My dad said after that encounter, he had nightmares every night and would swear that at night, he would see the red eyes outside of the house until they finally moved from Concho. After he moved, he never had a nightmare about the eyes again. But it wasn't his last encounter with the red-eyed creature. He would see it again when he became an adult. But that is a story for another time. As legend goes, to become a skinwalker, you must attain priesthood and then kill a member of your own family. Then, and only then, can you gain the powers to shapeshift. Then, and only then, are you a true skinwalker. According to local folklore, a man had just done that. An Indian priest not only killed one, but five immediate members of his family. They never caught this man. He disappeared into the woods, never to be seen again. When Jason and Alex set out for their camping trip, they knew all the old legends, and they laughed at the idea that a skinwalker would come get them if they ventured out onto the old native land, the same land that the supposed murders took place. And why should they believe the legends? A legend of a man becoming a beast? Jason and Alex were brothers. They spent their entire lives together until Jason had gotten married. Then, Jason moved away and started a family. But not Alex. Alex stayed in their hometown, tending to their parents, making an honest living off the land, and trying to be a good person. And Alex had succeeded at this. He hadn't broken a commandment in years and was well on his way, well, in his own mind, to heaven. Three years had passed between their last get-together and three more might have passed if Alex didn't insist on a camping trip, but insist he did, and there they were. It was getting dark and the two of them were laying out under the stars. They were deep in the woods and they had no GPS or maps, but they knew the path back from where they were. They had gone there as kids. Never know, huh? Alex replied. 
he only caught bits and pieces sometimes. We can never let that know, Jason said. Know what? That we stayed on the old native land past dark. We promised him as kids, and I wouldn't want to upset him now. He's getting pretty close to dead, and if we started an argument now, we may not resolve it in time. For, you know, just don't tell him or Ma, okay? Okay, sure. They both were silent for a while, until up creeped a small raccoon. Well, look at that, Alex called, as he pointed towards the critter. It stared at them for several minutes, not moving, not attempting to flee when they motioned towards it. It stayed, almost perfectly, still. And then, finally, it left. Minutes later came a deer, and again the creature stayed and watched them. Unwavering determination glared in its eyes. For almost two hours the brothers were kept awake, as every animal they knew to live in the forest, and some they were almost sure that didn't inhabit the area, came to gaze upon them. The final animal was a gray wolf. It slowly moved towards them, and when it was five feet away, it stopped. Don't move. Don't panic. It'll go, Jason assured Alex. The wolf slowly stood up on its hind legs, and then its limbs began to contort and pop. Horror slid over Jason and Alex's faces as they saw the fur tear open revealing light brown flesh underneath. Finally, they gazed upon what looked like a man with a wolf head. The skull of the wolf split open like a melon, the fur sliding off of it, the bone chipping and falling like a fragile eggshell. And then in its pace, slowly grew out the head of a man. The man now stood before the paralyzed brothers. They couldn't seem to move. This is my land, said the man with an almost supernatural smile. Get the fuck away from us, Jason said as fiercely as he could. The man began to laugh, and as he continued to laugh the pitch changed. It grew deeper, from that of a man to that of a demon. And soon, it sounded as if the devil himself was out to get them. The man's skin grew black as coal, and his eyes yellow like a cat's. His demonic laughter echoed through the forest as he drew closer and closer. The brothers being unarmed, they had no choice other than to flee, and that's what they did. They ran as fast as they could, except instead of out to their cars, they were cornered into running deeper into the woods. For hours they seemed to play cat and mouse. Several times animals they passed would burst open, revealing the deranged man. But they continued to run. Finally, reaching a cabin, they ducked inside. They were filled with fear, and the brothers felt that leaving the cabin would result in them dying. What they found in the cabin made them regret their ignorance on legends. For in the main bedroom of the cabin were corpses, at least a hundred of them. Every animal they had seen that night was there. And then they saw larger bodies, human bodies. It was then that the man burst into the room, except he was once more a wolf. In his deep voice, he said, Welcome home. The following week, the police found the cabin during their search for Jason and Alex. They found the brothers, but their faces looked as if they were eaten by an animal of some sort. Six days later, a security camera several states over caught Alex filling up a car with gas. Several witnesses also reported seeing the dead man, and on nearly all accounts, he was seen smiling. A wide, unnatural grin.
My mother is visiting my brother's family, just east of Nevada. My brother and his wife have a night out, and mom's watching over the kids, who are three and five years old at the time. She has just gotten them off to bed and goes into the living room to watch her programs. She nods off in front of the TV and is awakened around 11.30. She says that she hears whistling, not the bored, absent-minded kind, but by someone who is really good at it. She finds it strange that someone would be outside at this time of night, not only whistling, but seemingly close to the house. She goes over to the picture window. The moon is bright, the reflection casting a pale glow upon the rooftops of the nearby houses that are on the reservation. When suddenly, dogs from the neighbors saw start barking at once. They sound scared, and they are barking like if it's a warning. Despite the noise, she now hears a different whistle, the kind of police use or sports officials, and it's coming from there by the road which runs along the side of the house. She puts on her robe and goes out to the porch and around to that side of the house. There in the road is this guy who, when he notices her standing there, says that he's the local medicine man. He holds up his whistle like it's some kind of badge. He then tells her there is a skinwalker running through the neighborhood and that she should go back inside and lock the door. My brother finds out the next day from the neighbors that there was a critter of some sort jumping from one roof to the next. So anybody listening to this, if you ever hear whistling out at night, don't go outside. If you hear any noises outside your window at night, don't go outside. And whatever you do, don't ever say a word or whistle back. I'll tell you something that is true and real. My grandpa lived in Utah. He always told me stories about skinwalkers and how they could take the form of any animal or anyone that you know. I asked him one day if he had ever met one. He told me that he did a long time ago when he was, and he said, young and foolish. It was long before I was born or even my mother. He explained that he had gone to the valley. He called it Skinwalker Valley. He said it was a valley where nothing living ever ventures out, and where even crows, the guardians of death itself, won't go. It's a place of darkness and evil. He told me he went out there one day because he wanted to show others there was nothing to fear. Nothing but city superstition. He said he went out there in his old pickup truck, red in color but faded. When he found the valley, he saw that the grass on the ground and all of the trees were black. He said that the trees were still living though. And not far from where he exited his truck, he said there was a house. It was very old. The roof had fallen in and the door was gone. When he got closer to it, he said he noticed what looked to be deep scratches or claw marks on the side walls. He also described seeing the scattered bones and partial skeletons of animals all over the place as if he had wandered into some sacred burial ground. As he is standing outside the house, he dares not to go in. He hears the voice of his grandmother, but she had died some time prior. Then there were other voices. They were calling to him, calling for his life, his skin, his blood, and even for his spirit and soul. He knew them to be the voices of the lost, those who could change from man to beast. He quickly ran back to his truck, convinced that he was being pursued every step of the way. Right after that, and for some time to come, he would find possessions of his, even if they were brand new and unused, broken, torn, missing, or even 
as was the case with some of the family's animals, dead. It even got to the point where he wouldn't let his dog stay outside at night. And to show me that he wasn't lying, and he made me promise I wouldn't tell my mother, he pulled up his shirt and showed me these deep and ugly scars along his back. He told me that they were made by the claws of the skinwalker that chased him back to his truck. His only warning to me was to never look a skinwalker in the eye. If you do, it will never forget you and mark you for life. It will have your soul. My grandfather passed away recently. At his ceremony, my uncle laughed in a way that was kind of uncomfortable. Joked that he always thought my grandpa was a skinwalker himself. I want to start the story off by saying that I am Navajo. I live in Utah and growing up my family never mentioned skinwalkers or witches to me so I know nothing about them. My grandpa died just before the summer so my parents sent me to live with my grandma to help her around her ranch. For company I brought my cat along with me. He was an orange tabby. We had only been there two weeks when my cat went missing. I figured that he would come back but he never did. I called him and looked for him but nothing. A few days later I was bringing some hay out behind the barn when something orange caught my eye. It was the remains of my cat. By the looks of it he was attacked by something, most likely a coyote. They're all around here. However, when I picked it up, I used a pitchfork and I immediately noticed that there were no bones. It was just a pile of skin and fur. But I also noticed that there were small splotches of what seemed to be red, yellow, and white paint. At first I thought he might have gotten into something, but the way the paint was on his fur if you told me someone had put it there on purpose, I'm not sure you would be wrong. Even though there wasn't much left to him, I did love him and I was heartbroken. So I put his remains in a wood box that my grandmother had in the barn and buried him behind a hill. I marked his final resting spot with a nice stone I found and so that everyone would know he was there. I painted his name and the date in neat white letters and numbers. Only a couple of nights later, I was hearing just outside the Hogan and something scratching at the door. My grandmother, however, doesn't have any other cat and I don't remember seeing any hanging around the ranch. Regardless, I go over and open the door or at least look out and each time there was nothing. After a couple of nights of this, I decided come the morning to go check on my cat's grave. When I got out to the hill, I saw that the stone was still in place and nothing looked disturbed. But something told me it wasn't right. I went back to the barn for a shovel and came back and carefully dug up the grave. I removed the box and before opening it, said a little prayer. When I took off the lid, you can imagine my surprise when his fur and skin were gone. And instead, the box now contained his bones. At least I thought they were his. I just couldn't believe it. I know for a fact that when I buried that box, it was with fur and skin and not a bone in sight. I wish I could say that this incident was the only strangeness that I experienced while living there, but it's not. As a result, my respect for the Navajo Nation, what the elders say, and for skinwalkers, has now grown. I'm not saying I was involved with one, but now I really believe and know why our elders don't talk about them. What I will tell you is, 
Don't seek them out. Stop researching about them. Stop thinking about them. You're basically inviting them into your life. Because even with small attention that you give them, they will come looking for you. My friend and I were at a party on the Hopi Reservation in Polaka. It was getting late and we had a pretty good buzz on. Most of the people we knew had already trickled out. So we decided it was a good time as any to leave. We looked around for the friend who was supposed to give us a ride because we had all come together. We found him in a back bedroom, drunk and passed out. So we had no choice. We're gonna have to walk. The two of us lived on the other side of the gulch. A good two miles. Between were nothing but trees, scrubs, brushes, and some hills. We had barely cleared the houses onto the road passing between the wooded area when we got this funny feeling we were being watched. We decided to leave the road and cut through the trees. It wasn't the easiest walk, but it would cut the distance down some. And even though it was pitch black outside, we knew the way pretty well. We had been a good 20 minutes off the road and heading up towards the hills when that same feeling of being watched came upon us again. We both turned around at the same time, but it was so dark we couldn't see anything. But then, my friend Paul swore he heard some kind of cackling or mumbling. I didn't hear anything except for maybe the wind and the top of the trees at our back. By that time, none of us was gonna admit it. We were feeling a little scared. Without saying a single word, we picked up the pace, moving along pretty good but not running. And that's when I heard it too. But now, it was more like heavy breathing. Paul then grabbed my arm and gave me a tug forward. We took off running straight up the hill, which wasn't that big, but it was still enough of a slope so I wasn't feeling it in my legs. And on top of that, I was drunk. Think about this for a second. Running up a hill, at night, drunk, complete darkness. And as you're running, you hear footsteps behind you and heavy breathing. Whatever it was though, stayed with us every step of the way. Right at the top, Paul and I stopped and turned around expecting the thing to be right on us. But we were standing there, huffing and puffing, and looking at nothing but darkness. A few seconds passed, and then we heard a thin laughter, as if it was coming from down the hill and back from where we started running. We decided to keep moving and put some distance between us. We turned to go down the other side of the hill, and there, standing right in front of us, was this creature. It was standing up on two legs, like a circus dog, only much taller, with both paws extended out in front of it. It had this coyote face, and it was grinning at us, all of its teeth exposed, and its tongue sliding from one side to the other. I couldn't believe how skinny it was, as if it hadn't ate in weeks. It's rounded stomach sticking out like one of those African kids in the charity ads. And the skin sinking between its ribs. The smell was unbelievably bad. Like the smell of an old, wet dog. We both jumped back with a scream. Like two little schoolgirls. As we did, the creature dropped down on all fours. And ran past us and down the hill back where we had come from. It was yipping and laughing all the way. Paul and I started praying like never before, swearing to Jesus that if he got us home safe, we would never drink again. The laughing, or whatever you want to call it, died down and disappeared. Wasting no time, the two of us made our way down that hill and into the trees 
that separated us from where we lived. As we walked along, we were trying to convince each other everything was okay. It was only a coyote out searching for a meal. We scared it, it jumped up at us, and then it ran away. We started feeling better about things overall. We got across the open field and into the trees. We made it all the way through there without anything else happening. However, just as we stepped out towards that first backyard that we needed a cut through to get to the street, we heard this unmistakable chatter, like some little monkey laughing coming out of the trees just behind us. It was followed by the sound of something moving through the branches and twigs. My friend Paul then yelled out some words that he said that his grandmother had taught him. And just like that, the noise ceased and it got real quiet. He then grabbed my arm again and we ran. We ran as fast as we could through that yard and out to the road. We ran straight for the house where Paul lives with his grandmother. When we got there, we found her awake and sitting in the kitchen with only a small candle for light. She was burning some cedar. When she saw us, she put her finger up to her lips and then pointed to the outside of the house. Her lips were moving, but silently. We stood there still for a minute or two, and then she spoke out loud, saying it was okay. She then said a prayer, and that the skinwalker was now gone. I have no idea how she knew, and I didn't care. Needless to say, I spent the rest of the night there, sleeping where I knew I would be safe. This story comes from a 28 year old young man who calls himself Leo. When he was a boy, his grandmother, a Navajo woman, would tell him stories about dark spirits and skinwalkers. He recalls he used to wave her off, telling her there was no such things. In fact, whenever he would go out at night, he would make sure to tell her and make fun of her that he'll be walking alone. However, his arrogance came back to get him shortly after his 17th birthday. On the evening in question, he is out cruising about with two of his cousins, just drinking a few beers, listening to music, and doing a whole bunch of laughing. From St. Michael's, Arizona, their purposeless selves takes them through sawmill and then along the back roads in and around Chinle where they eventually get lost for a while. Driving deep in the woods and looking for anything they might recognize as a way back to the road, Leo is sitting in the back seat on the passenger side and looking out the window. He recalls it is definitely after 10 p.m. There deep in the trees, he sees a single fire. The flames contain to a small space and close to the ground. He is just about to say something to the others when they too react. Looking now in the direction they are pointing, he sees many more of these small fires, literally dozens of them, popping up there within the trees burning brightly for a moment or two and then going out only to have others ignite but a few feet or yards away. This goes on all the while they are driving along through this one stretch and seems to be keeping pace with them. Leo first has the thought that it is maybe a controlled fire process, something the local rangers and fire department do to control the undergrowth to reduce the potential for out of control forest fires. But being that it is nighttime, he quickly discards the idea. Besides, he notices and mentions to his two cousins that the fire so close to the base of the trees should be setting them on fire as well. Yet not one of them goes up or from where he's looking even gets scorched. They're both spooked 
and intrigued, they pull the car alongside the road and get out, beers in hand. However, they stay by the car with no desire to actually go into the woods. One of the cousins starts calling out to see if anyone will answer. The other cousin is less eager, telling everyone to be quiet and listen. But there's nothing to listen to. The fires, which continue to flare up and die down, aren't making any noise. For example, there's no crackling of anything burning, not even small twigs. Then within seconds, they find themselves standing in the dark. Every fire has now gone out, and there's not even new ones. Not believing their own eyes, they walk into the trees towards where they had agreed that one of the near fires had been. But no matter how much they look around, they can't find any sign of fire. No smoke, no charred ground, and no ashes. Nothing. There isn't even the smell of burned leaves or wood they expect to linger. But what's even more strange is that when they do go back to the car, they can't help but notice the smell of smoke on their clothes. The next morning comes, and Leo tells his grandmother and mother what he had seen. While his mother shows very little interest, there is a knowing gleam in the eyes of his grandmother, but she has nothing to say. Almost immediately after that night, Leo says everything that could possibly go wrong does. First, each one of his cousins that were with them are involved in unexplainable accidents and are hurt seriously enough. One of them receives a second degree burn when the gas tank of a motorcycle he is working on ignites without reason or warning. The second one suffers a broken collarbone when the branch of a tree in his yard snaps and comes down across his shoulder. He too has no warning, even though he acknowledges that it is the same tree that was hit by lightning a month or so earlier. Strange enough, both accidents happen on the same day and almost at the same time. As for Leo, even though it's much less painful, all of the family vehicles break down within days of each other. It is at this point that the family makes the choice to seek the help of the local medicine man. Together, they climb into his aunt's car. She's the mother of the cousin with the broken collarbone, which had worked fine earlier that day, but now it refuses to start. Leo suggests that it's the battery, so they attempt to jumpstart it with his grandfather's truck. It is not in the best shape. It's driven only locally, and it's not even registered or insured, but it always starts. But this time, it won't turn over. Finally, they find a neighbor who is nice enough to take them. When they get to the medicine man and tell him everything, starting with the fires, he says to them, You already know who is doing this to you. Leo recalls they all just look at one another each without a clue. His grandmother, however, tells them that she'll explain it on the ride back home. She sends them out to the car to wait while she speaks with the medicine man. When she comes back, she tells them that it's going to be okay. On the way back, Leo's grandmother tells them about her great-grandfather. She says that the family had a 30-acre plot which they had been living on for generations. When he passed away, and before his own children could lay claim to the property, a man and his wife built themselves a crude hogan on the far side of the property and moved in. When her great-grandfather's sons, one of whom was her grandfather, tried to evict the man from the property, he used dark medicine to chase them off. He even kept their own father from building a house on the far side of the property along the arroyo. She then tells Leo that the woods in which he and his cousins saw the fire is the outer edge of that property and the smoke they smelled on themselves was the mark of the skinwalker. 
she says the old squatter and his wife are both more than a hundred years old and even though no one has seen them for years she's still sure that they live there still all leo knows is that since the visit with the medicine man he and his family have had no further experiences with the skinwalker he says that there are nights when the dogs bark and it seems they try to break free from their chains like there's something out in the darkness which they want no part of on those nights leo is sure to say his prayers both in navajo and the ones he learned in the catholic church he's convinced the words will protect him from the old man and his wife two powerful skinwalkers that he doesn't want playing around in his head <laughs>